Today we're beginning a new message series called Prophetic Living, and we're going to be looking at the life of Samuel. Uh, Samuel was an Old Testament prophet. He lived in a time of, of Israel's history that was spiritually pretty barren. I mean, there weren't a lot of bright spots in Israel at this time. Uh, the, the nation was facing chaotic times in many different ways. If you look at your Bible, the book right before 1 Samuel, which tells us about Samuel, was the book of Judges. And that was a time when the judges ruled Israel, and it was a time of decay. Uh, it was a time of, of really terrible things happening. And uh, people, it says, basically through the book of Judges, everyone did what they saw was right in their own eyes. They really weren't following God, and things didn't work out so well. And so God raised Samuel up as a prophet and ultimately as a judge, and, and he was going to use Samuel to anoint the first kings of Israel. 1 Samuel 3 verse 1 says, And the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and there, were, there was no frequent vision. And so people weren't seeking God. When people aren't seeking God, God wasn't really seeking, I mean, God was not um, speaking to people as he perhaps would have liked to. Prophets were not seeing visions from the Lord. Eli was the high priest who served in the temple. He was growing very old, and it says his eyes were dim. And as we'll see even today, not only was his physical eyes dim, his spiritual eyes were dim as well. He really wasn't walking with God in the way he should have. Even more telling was the condition of Eli's sons. He as a father should have been overseeing his sons. Uh, they served in the temple with him. Here's the report of what God's word says about his sons. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And so uh, not a good, a good thing. Eli's sons were treating the laws regarding the handling of sacrifices with contempt. They ate whatever they wanted when people brought things in rather than sacrificing it to God. Uh, they slept with the women who served in the, in the temple. All kinds of things were going on that were ungodly. And so it was just uh, em uh, emblematic of the downward spiral of the nation at that time. Uh, in some ways, it's similar to what's happening in America today. Uh, I think many people believe America is in a downward spiral morally, and yet God was still sovereign. God was still in control. He was still working in the difficult circumstances, and it was through God's power that a great prophet, Samuel, was raised up to serve him at that time. And today we're going to talk about God's call. We're going to see how God called Samuel and how God taught him to hear his voice. Now let's just, for a minute, think about what it means to be a prophet. First of all, a prophet has to hear God speak to him. Uh, he has to have ears to hear what God is saying. He must learn to hear the voice of God. And then secondly, a prophet must take what he's heard and then speak that message to those that God directs him to speak. So there's two aspects of being a prophet, hearing from God and then speaking God's word to those that God directs him to speak to. Now, in the nation of Israel, the first great prophet was Moses, and he was also a great leader of the nation of Israel. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 29, Moses said, Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. In the Old Testament, God raised up certain people to be prophets. We're going to talk about Samuel. He was anointed to be a prophet minister to Israel. And yet God's desire, his ultimate desire, as prophesied through that first great prophet, Moses, was that all believers should prophesy. That all believers, in a sense, would be prophets. And Moses' prophecy began to be fulfilled, ultimately, on the day of Pentecost, when all the believers were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they began to prophesy as they spoke in tongues. Peter quoted the, uh, the prophet Joel in the book of Acts to describe what was happening on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 2, verse 17, he says, In the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And so here we see that 
Ultimately, Moses' prophecy was beginning to be fulfilled. God's Spirit was poured out on the entire church, and the promise here is that all shall prophesy. Paul, in his teaching on spiritual gifts, in 1 Corinthians 14, says that all believers baptized in the Holy Spirit are able to prophesy. He says, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged, and the spirit of prophets are subject to the prophets. And so as we read through the, Old, uh, through the New Testament, we see New Testament prophets operating in the churches of the Lord. And so contrary to sometimes what we think, prophets are only Old Testament, uh, an Old Testament office, uh, prophecy and prophets are all over the New Testament if we read carefully. And so no matter what your life stage you are in today, no matter what your job may be today, if you're a believer, God wants to speak to you. And he desires for you to speak his word to others, which is really the, the essence of prophecy. When we speak God's word to unbelievers, we're witnessing to them. And when we speak God's word to believers through spiritual gifts, we encourage them and we edify, we build them up. And so as we go through this series on Samuel, we're not just going to be looking at this as ancient history. Everything we're going to look at did happen. But we're going to learn about growing in the prophetic. We're going to learn about God's plan for our lives. So we're going to begin this study by looking not at Samuel, but at Samuel's mother, who was Hannah. And we're going to look at the importance of prayer in Samuel's mother's life. So our story begins in 1 Samuel with a man named Elkanah, who was a worshiper of the Lord. But he also had two wives. So his two wives were Penina and Hannah. And so Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And Penina constantly irritated Hannah about not having any children. So this marriage with two wives was certainly not God's will. Every time you see a marriage with multiple wives, you see problems. And here we see problems going on, okay? And uh, <clears throat> God was still sovereign in all circumstances. You know, we don't know how Hannah got into this arrangement but she was there, and God can still work in less than perfect circumstances. And so in verse 5, it says, But to Hannah, Elkanah gave a double portion you know, of food because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And so here we learn that the Lord was active. The Lord knew what was going on in, in, in this family. But he was the one who had closed Hannah's womb, so she could not bear children, where her co-wife, I don't know what it would be called, uh, the other, other woman, uh, had a, had, was bearing children. But it was not a coincidence that Hannah could not bear children. God had done it. And yet Hannah wanted a son. And so over the years, she learned to persevere in prayer. The family took trips to the temple to worship the Lord. And on one of the trips we learn more about the prayer that Hannah was praying. 1 Samuel 1, verse 10, in the temple, it says she was, this is Hannah, was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look at the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. So Hannah didn't give up on having a son, but she continued to pray for the Lord to grant her desire for a son. She called herself, as you look through this, the Lord's servant, your servant. I'm the servant of the Lord. She called it herself Lord's servant multiple times, and she vowed to give back her son to the Lord. If God would give her a son, she would give him back to the Lord. Now, this son, she would teach to live according to the Nazarite vow. Uh, that was the vow where uh, you shaved the hair of your head and uh, you didn't partake of any strong drink, any wine, anything made of the fruit of the vine, and you were completely set apart for the Lord. Another person who took the Nazarite vow was Samson. Uh, and so it was uh, something that was available in the Old Testament. And so even though Hannah was praying regularly at home for a son, she thought it important to pray her prayer in the temple where Eli the priest served. And 
by praying in the temple, she was actually sharing her prayer with Eli, the high priest at the time. So as Hannah was praying in the temple, uh, she was praying silently. She was praying with great emotion. Eli was observing her, maybe not seeing too well because the Bible says his eyes were dim. But he thought she was drunk, and he began to criticize her for coming to the temple while she was drinking. Uh, obviously, Eli didn't have great discernment, and uh, he was just kind of going about what he thought was going on at this stage in his life. So Hannah explained to Eli, no, I'm not drunk. I haven't been drinking. I'm just pouring out my heart to the Lord. I really desire to have a son, and I, I'm just filled with, with great emotion. And uh, I'm praying for this son. I've been praying for a long time, and the prayer has not yet been answered. Well, Eli, to his credit, realized his error, and he responded prophetically to her prayer. He said to her, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. And so Eli encouraged her that the Lord was going to answer her prayer. And Hannah believed that Eli's response was the assurance that God was going to grant her request. She had faith that her prayer had been heard. And really, Eli had given her a prophetic encouragement that God had heard and God was going to answer that prayer. And so not only did Hannah persevere in prayer on her own, but she went to a place where other believers were, where Eli was a believer, she shared her prayer with him, and ultimately she received the faith that her prayer was going to be answered. So now let's think for a minute about Hannah and her prayer life and learn some principles that apply to our lives today. Hannah believed that, that God desired for her to have a son. It was God's will for her to have a son, but it was not happening. The Scripture says that the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. And perhaps, we don't know for sure, but perhaps Hannah knew that this was God's doing. And so she was praying, God, I'm asking that you open my womb. It's been closed. It's not happening. I, I pray that you open it so that I can have children. Hannah was not bitter. She was not angry at God. She continued to seek his face. And finally, she received assurance that her prayer would be answered. And as we'll see, of course, her prayer was answered. So this morning, I want each of us to think about an issue in your life, an issue that is pressing, something that you believe is God's will, but it has not yet happened. What should we do? Well, Hannah gives us an example, does she not? We should continue to persevere in prayer. Hannah persevered in prayer over a number of years before her prayer was answered. Share your prayer with others in the church family. Hannah came to the temple and prayed in the presence of the high priest, and there were probably others there in the temple as well. As we join in faith together, the Bible says that the Lord is in our midst, where two or three are gathered in his name. And as our faith is joined together in prayer, God will give assurance that the answer is on its way in God's time. Just this last week, we've had our first uh, meeting of, of our Seek God meeting for people to come together to seek God, uh, to move in their lives, to move in our city, to move in our nation. And uh, we have opportunities now every Wednesday night, except this next Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the month, we're not going to have the Seek God. Um, we actually have a ministry team meeting that night. But the other Wednesdays, we encourage you to come when you can to seek God together with us. In addition... To those meetings, we also have, um, we have the uh, prayer and praise, which is kind of on the same, it's a little bit different format, but we have that on the third Wednesday of the month, and uh, we also have life groups that meet together to pray together. So we encourage you, pray on your own, but spend some time seeking God with other believers. Next, dedicate your prayer answer. We'll explain what that means in a minute. Verse 20, in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I've asked for him from the Lord. And so God answered Hannah's prayer. He opened her womb, which had been closed. She conceived. She bore a son. 
and called him Samuel, which means heard of God. God heard her prayer and answered it. Now, Hannah then needed to do something, did she not? She needed to keep her vow. Remember, Hannah had made a vow to the Lord when he gave her her son that she would give him to the Lord all the days of her life. And so after the son was born, Hannah told her, uh, told her father or told her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. And so Hannah said, I'm going to keep him until he's weaned, uh, which in those times was normally two to three years. It could be up to six years. Sometimes they uh, fed a child for quite a long time. But in those early years at home, undoubtedly Hannah prayed for Samuel each and every day as she cared for this newborn baby and taught him as much as she could about the Lord. But finally the time came for Hannah to, to release the son that she'd prayed for, but she had vowed that she would give him to the Lord to release her sacrifice. And so Hannah took him, took little Samuel, certainly, you know, probably between four and six years old, very young boy. She took an animal sacrifice to present him to Eli, the priest in the temple. And she told Eli, though I keep getting ahead of myself in these scriptures, she said, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. And so Hannah released her sacrifice of, of Samuel to serve the Lord in the temple with Eli. Now, I've never been a mother, but you mothers, put yourself in Hannah's shoes. Okay? How would it how difficult would it be to take this child, your only child, your only son, just a young boy, four to six years old, and take him to the temple, which was many, many miles from their home. We'll see later she visited him once a year and leave him there with this priest. It must have been very, very difficult. It must have been difficult for Samuel to leave his mother and Go to the temple to serve this elderly priest there. And yet, as Hannah entrusted Samuel to the Lord, it became an occasion for worship. Does he worship the Lord there? I guess little Samuel was worshiping God along with his parents. The next chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 2, we don't have time to look at it this morning, contains a prophetic prayer by Hannah about God's faithfulness, about God's sovereignty in her life, and in the whole world, uh, she was a strong woman of prayer. It was no accident that she bore a son who was one of the greatest prophets who ever lived in the nation of Israel. And so we see what a prayer warrior Hannah was in the depth of her faith. So this part of the story gives us another important perspective on prayer. Oftentimes we think of prayer as simply getting something from God that we need. And that certainly is part of prayer, but there's much, much more. Hannah desired a, a son. That was her need, and God answered her prayer, but God had another purpose. It wasn't just about answering Hannah's prayer, was it? It was not just about giving Hannah a son. God was raising up her son, or had plans to raise up her son Samuel as a prophet, and to be uh, the last judge over Israel, and to bring in the kings that, that uh, were going to come to Israel. And so Hannah released the answer to her prayer, which was a son. She released Samuel to God's greater purpose. And that's what God wants us to do as well. You see, when we pray, how are we to pray? We are to pray everything in Jesus' name, are we not? And that's not just a phrase we tack on the end of a prayer. It means that we are praying for the things that Jesus would want, for the things that are in God's purpose. And that means when we pray prayers like that, that not only will the answer meet our needs, but even more importantly, the answer will be in accordance with God's will. It will bring God glory. And so when God blesses you with an answer to your prayers, don't just keep the answer to yourself, but entrust to the Lord that answer for His purposes, for His glory. In one sense, when God blesses us, he blesses us to be a blessing to others, and we release that blessing into God's purposes. 
So now we're going to switch gears. We've been talking about Hannah, Samuel's mother, who's, and um, we're going to switch gears from her to Samuel, who is now in the temple as a young boy, ministering to the Lord under the guidance of Eli the priest. And God is teaching Samuel at an early age to prepare to hear God. Moving on to chapter 3, now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. It was said before that Hannah came to visit Samuel once a year, and the Lord blessed her with what? Three more sons and two daughters. So she gave away one and she received back five. So that was a pretty good deal. Uh, God didn't leave her out. You think, oh, I have to give my only boy away. And God understood, and he gave her five more. But Samuel was in the temple. He was growing. He was learning to serve the Lord from Eli. He apparently slept in the temple, and the temple was a place where the ark of God, <clears throat> where the ark of God was, where the presence of the Lord was. And so he was, he was in a close proximity to, to God's presence. Even as a, as a very young boy. And Samuel, we'll see, had a, had a very willing heart to serve God. One night, as Samuel was sleeping, he heard someone calling his name. Samuel, Samuel. And he thought the only other person in close proximity was Eli. So he ran to Eli and said, did you call me? Eli said, no, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. Samuel lay down again. He heard the sound again. Samuel, Samuel. He went to Eli. Eli said, no, I didn't call you. We'll go back to sleep. Went back to sleep. The third, time he, the third time God called Samuel, he ran to Eli again. Eli said, you know, I think something's going on here. Uh, I think that maybe God is calling you, Samuel. And so here's how you should respond. So Samuel went back. The fourth time God called Samuel, Samuel, uh, it says, the Lord came and stood calling as at other times, verse 10, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. So first of all, in this, in this uh, episode, we see that Samuel, Samuel was open to learning from Eli. He had, a, had an open heart. When he saw something or heard something, he didn't recognize what it was. He went to his mentor. He went to the priest and said, what's going on? Did you call me? When Eli gave him instructions what to do, Samuel did exactly what he said and responded to the Lord in that way. Secondly, Samuel had been faithfully serving God. He'd been serving God in the temple. He considered himself God's servant. He was ready to do whatever God was going to ask him to do. And in fact, the very first thing God asked him to do, we'll see, was a very, very difficult test. But Samuel had prepared himself and God was now beginning to speak to him. But remember, the first part of being a prophet is simply hearing the voice of God. But there's a second part, which is often even more difficult, is speaking God's message. And so the message that the Lord spoke to Samuel was a very, very difficult word. The Lord said that judgment was going to come and fall on Eli and his family because Eli did not restrain his sons or discipline his sons from blaspheming God. Well, imagine little Samuel getting this message, laying on his little bed. He didn't run to Eli and say, hey, guess what I heard? Guess what God told me? He was afraid. Uh, he waited all night. He was afraid to tell Eli the message. And he didn't immediately tell Eli. Well, the next morning, Eli knew that God had spoken to Samuel, and he urged Samuel to tell him the message. In verse 18, finally, then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he, that is Eli, said, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. Eli seems kind of resigned uh, to his fate at that point. The next verses tell us how Samuel continued to hear from God and to speak God's message. It says, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. 
And so this was just the very beginning. Samuel learned as time went on to hear clearly from God as God was speaking to him. And he spoke the things that God told him to speak. And so basically it, it says none of his words fell to the ground. All of his words came to pass. They were true and they were what God was speaking. And so Samuel continued to grow and mature as a prophet of the Lord throughout all Israel. Undoubtedly, uh, by this time, he was a young man at least, and uh, this took place over a number of years. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, the very next chapter, it records there was a battle with the Philistines, and both of Eli's sons were killed in battle. In the battle, the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines, and, of course, that was a very important part of Israel. And when Eli, back in the temple, uh, because the ark had been carried by the soldiers into battle, it was captured by the Philistines, word came back to Eli in the temple that the ark of the covenant had been captured by the pagan Philistines. And Eli fell off his chair, broke his neck, and died. And so God's judgment prophesied by Samuel had come to pass. And so the Bible makes it clear that God is still speaking to his children today. God didn't stop speaking uh, when Jesus came. I mean, the New Testament makes it very clear. God continued to speak through New Testament times. And the verses in the New Testament make it very clear. God continues to speak. He'll continue to speak until Jesus returns again. So just like Samuel, we need to learn to recognize the voice of the Lord. Now it appears that we're not 100% sure, but it appears that Samuel heard an audible voice, something that he thought uh, was, an audible, was an audible voice speaking to him. God doesn't always speak with an audible voice, but God speaks in many different ways. Oftentimes, he speaks into our spirits, into our, into our minds. We need to learn to recognize the voice of God. Now, how do we do that? Well, learning to hear God's voice, uh, first of all, you learn to hear the type of things God speaks by reading and studying his word. And that also helps you discern if you're hearing another voice that says anything contrary to God's word. You know, hey, this isn't God. It's something else. There are other voices that may try to speak to us. Spend time in God's word. Spend time in prayer. Both alone and with other people will help attune your spiritual ears to hearing from God. And then we must not be afraid. When God speaks to us, sometimes it's just for us. And other times it's meant for us to speak to somebody else. And that's never easy. It wasn't easy for Samuel to give that first message that God gave him. But we must not be afraid. We must have the courage and boldness to speak what God tells us to speak to others around us. I believe God will give us words to speak to the people that we prayed for today. The people that are on your heart that do not yet know the Lord. God wants to use you to speak into their lives. And if you wait on God, he's going to give you words to speak to them. It may not be easy, but God will help you to do it. God desires to give believers words to encourage other believers. In our church services, in life groups, in prayer groups, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you can give a word from the Lord to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. It was Samuel was just speaking to Eli. It was two people. Uh, it doesn't have to be in groups. 1 Corinthians 14, 39 we don't have it up on the slide, but it instructs every believer to earnestly desire to prophesy. Uh, it's not a gift just for a few. It's for each and every believer. And that, how do we prophesy? It begins with learning to hear God speak and then speaking his word to those that he leads us to. And so there's many things that we can learn from this very first chapter, the first chapters of 1 Samuel. And I, I would encourage you to read 1 Samuel chapters 1 to 5 to get the Whole, this week to get the whole scheme of things. We certainly don't have time to read five chapters on Sunday morning, uh, but that will help you uh, during the week to really assimilate the message into your own life. I believe God wants us to make prayer a, a greater priority in our own lives and in our church, and we're seeking to do that. He wants to teach us to pray according to his will. And then dedicate the answers to him. It's not just about us. It's too often, even myself, we, we pray and it's all about us. This is what I want. This is what I need. But God wants us to give the blessing that he brings into our lives to give it to others as well, to dedicate 
his answers to him. And as we continue to grow in prayer, we're going to get better at hearing God speak. We're going to get better at hearing God's will. And when we hear God clearly, we're going to have his words to speak prophetically to those around us, to speak God's truth into people's lives. There's many different ways we can do that. And when God's word is spoken, it will always accomplish its purpose. The word of God will always do what God intends. Now, the first step to becoming a believer, in order to hear God speak, we need to have a relationship with God. To become a believer, to become a Christian, according to the Bible's definition, we need to admit that we've sinned, that, that we've done wrong things. Secondly, we need to believe that Jesus died on the cross, that our sins might be forgiven, invite him into our lives to forgive our sins, and commit our lives to following him as our Lord. So we're going to pray now. I'd like to ask everyone to bow your heads. If you'd like to commit your life to Jesus Christ or recommit your life to him this morning for the first time, I would encourage you to pray along with me something like this. Father, today I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. I repent. I turn away from those sins. I believe Jesus died on the cross, paid the penalty for my sin that I might be forgiven. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. I commit myself to following you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for your great love for me. And for those of us who are believers, let's pray as well. Father, today we, we thank you for this, this challenging story from the lives of Hannah and Samuel, people who lived thousands of years ago. Forgive us for not trusting you at all, at all times when we face setbacks in life. Sometimes we get upset with you, God, but help us to believe that you know what you're doing. Continue to seek you in prayer, persevering in our prayers until the answer comes. May we dedicate whatever blessing that you bring into our lives back to you, that it might become a blessing to others around us. Teach us how to hear more clearly the things that you are speaking to us. We believe you're speaking all the time. We pray that you give us ears to hear what you're speaking. And then grant us the courage to boldly speak what you speak to us, to those who need to hear the truth. May we not be shy. May we not be afraid. But give us the boldness to speak your words so that they can accomplish your purpose. We thank you, God, that we are able to partner with you in bringing your kingdom to this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.